Maybe you've heard of the Jamstack or maybe you haven't, but if you're interested in learning how to build apps with the Jamstack, welcome to this Jamstack crash course where we will build a full stack application using some pretty cool technologies like FaunaDB for the database, Netlify for hosting and for serverless functions, and then React on the front end to bring it all together. I hope you are as excited as I am. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, you may or may not know what the Jamstack actually is. So let's talk about that before we actually get started building this application. Jamstack stands for JavaScript, APIs, and Markup. And the interesting thing about this is that even though Jamstack seems to be the new hotness, it's really nothing new. We've used JavaScript for years. We've used APIs to go and get and interact with data. We've used Markup and HTML and then Markdown and things like that. We've used those things for years. JavaScript or Jamstack is really this new way of putting those things together. And a couple of things that are important, you can check out some information on jamstack.org, is that you're building fast and secure sites that are delivered by pre-rendering files. So you get into some of the uh, conversations around static sites, pre-generating HTML. One of the most important things here though, is that these files get served directly from a CDN. So let's say we have a React application and we go through the build process. Those files just sit on a content delivery network or a CDN. And then when a user requests that web page, those files get sent back directly. There's no dynamic calculation of those pages. It doesn't mean you can't do dynamic things on the front end. It means that those pages are served statically from a CDN. And you remove the requirement to manage or run web servers. Now, the interesting thing about this is if you don't have a server, then how do you add backend functionality? And this is where Netlify comes in for two things. Uh, we host our site in Netlify, or we can host our site in Netlify as a CDM. Netlify also has, in my mind, the easiest way to implement serverless functions as part of your Jamstack application. So what we're going to do is we're going to use FaunaDB, which we'll talk about in a second, as our database, and we will interact with that database through our Netlify serverless functions, and then call those functions from our React front end. It's actually a lot to put together, but I think it's going to be really exciting. Now, I do want to share a couple of resources as we get started. One, you'll have a link to the source code, so you can go and grab all of that. And then uh, a couple of other things, uh, on learn.jamesqquick.com, you can find all the courses and, and webinars and things that I do, including I've got a free cheat sheet for Netlify serverless functions. So all the configuration and things that we do in Netlify to facilitate all of this you can grab that cheat sheet and it'll just have kind of a walkthrough of how to set all this stuff up as well. You can grab that for free. I also have a React and serverless full stack web development course that you can check out as well, links down below. So this will uh, basically be kind of a beefed up version of what we do today, adding things like authentication and uh, all the configurations and things that you would need. So all of that said, uh, what we're gonna do is actually jump over to uh, FaunaDB and let's actually go to the, the homepage here. So in FaunaDB, this is the data API for your client serverless applications. Fauna really uh, prides itself as being a database that makes a lot of sense in the Jamstack and specifically when you're using serverless functions like we are today. So that's why it makes for a great fit just for the Jamstack in general. So you will need to uh, go ahead and sign up for a free account. And then I am logged in from my GitHub or from my GitHub profile so I can log in through GitHub. So when I'm logged in, I've got a database here called serverless fauna. And what we're going to do is end up creating a new database. Uh, that was the one that I was testing for the demo. And so we're going to create a new database and we're just going to call this a uh, list O links. And it says cannot contain spaces. So let's just make this all uh, lowercase and um, connected by hyphens instead of spaces. So let's go ahead and save that. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're actually gonna work with GraphQL in this, which I think is gonna be a lot of fun. So if you're new to GraphQL, this is uh, basically kind of an aggregated way of handling your API, your what would have been REST API requests. So let's say you're trying to access some resources through an API, usually make an HTTP request and, uh, and you have like a node server, for example, and that endpoint will go and get the data that you need out of the database. The problem with that is that if you need different pieces of data um, in different scenarios, you don't really have as much control over that. So the, the power of GraphQL is a consolidated space or uh, place to request exactly what you want. So as a requester, you're able to only get the things that you actually need. It's pretty interesting. 
All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna import a GraphQL schema. And the beauty of FaunaDB is we can import a really basic schema and they will take care of almost all of the actual GraphQL implementation and configuration behind the scenes that we don't have to worry about. If you've ever worked with GraphQL directly yourself, you probably realize or will understand how much this is taken care of for you. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you, this is gonna be our database. This is the definition, this GQL file, a links.gql file. This is gonna be what our application is. So uh, what we're gonna do is take this file where it defines a link object and it has a URL, a name, a description, and a whether or not it's uh, archived Boolean, and then we have a query type and we're saying that you can query for all links, but really GraphQL is gonna take care of the rest of the stuff for us. So uh, let's go, uh, you'll need to make a copy of this file. It's in the source code under utils inside of functions. Actually, let me just show you that. Inside of the source code under functions and then utils, you should see your links.gql. So you wanna download that file or create a copy of that yourself. And then uh, we're gonna upload that to FaunaDB. So let's go in and say import schema. And I've got this locally under my machine. All right, so I'm gonna go and grab that links.gql file. I'm going to uh, select to import that. And you'll see FaunaDB, uh, actually maybe it doesn't even take any time, has done all the behind the scenes stuff for us. So the interesting thing about this is inside of now this GraphQL tab, we can write a query. So a GraphQL query, um, in this case, we'll start with query. And uh, then we can do, if you ever uh, need help in here, option and space uh, will give you some intelligence on what you can do. So inside of here, for queries, we can uh, find a link by an ID or just grab all the links. And so for each link, uh, what we get back is a data property. That's just kind of a GraphQL standard there. And then for each piece of data that we get back, for each record out of the links object, what do we want to query? What information do we want? We probably want all of them here, but we could select if we only wanted the name or we only wanted the URL or we only wanted the description or what was the last piece in here? Uh, if we wanted ID and then uh, if we wanted archive. Now, obviously I've added all of the information here. Uh, you may not want all the information. So this is the power of GraphQL of really being able to specify exactly what data I want to get back. Now I can run this query. This is a really cool GraphQL Explorer here. And you see what comes back is you have a data property. Uh, that's just kind of what GraphQL uh, returns back. And then you have all links. So this is matching the query name. And then you have data, which then matches this thing. And then if we had any records, we would see those populate here. So what we're gonna do is let's also, uh, let's open up a new tab. And now let's do a mutation. So inside of our mutation, what can we do? Well, we can create, update, and delete links. And these are the things that uh, are taken care of for us in FaunaDB, which I think is really, really amazing. So let's just kind of simulate here creating a link. And with our create link, we'll need to pass uh, what information we want to use to create it. So it's kind of like a function that we're calling and we're passing it uh, what information it needs. So it's going to need a data property and that data is going to include the information for the, um, the link itself. So let's start with our name property and we'll just call this test link. And then we'll have the URL property and this will be um, HTTPS uh, slash slash www.jamesqquick.com. And let's go ahead and give this a name of uh, James website. All right, uh, so there's the URL, then we'll have the description, and this is James's site. I think that's all right, we do that okay. All right, and I wouldn't need an apostrophe, but that's okay. So we've got uh, the name, the URL, the description, and whether or not it's archived. So in this case, we'll say archived is uh, false, and that will be probably a default thing that we do. If you archive, or if you create something, it's probably not archived by default. And one of the things I forgot to mention is inside of GraphQL, we're defining these three properties. Since we're using the exclamation, these are now required. Archived is not required, all right? So we could just not pass archived if we wanted to, but we'll go ahead and specify this thing to be uh, false to start. And then inside of our create link, after we create it, what do we want to get back? Well, now we can just get kind of the information about that object. So we could get, Let's say the name and the underscore 
ID property. The underscore ID is one that Fauna creates for us. So let's go ahead and run this. And what this should do is create that link. If we then come back to our query and query uh, all links again, now we should see our new link was added. So we'll, we'll get into doing updates and deletes in here as well. Uh, but this is the basics of doing a GraphQL query to query or send a mutation to either create, re, create, update, or delete data. All right, so we've got that set up. Now, one of the things that I want to do is I'm going to choose a directory and I'm going to run create react app. And in this case, all I want to do is create a, um, a new react application. That's going to be the base of our project. So I'm going to run this and I'm going to call mine uh, FaunaDB Jamstack app, whatever. So this is MPX and then you're running create react app to create this new react application. I'll let that run and then we'll open this thing in a second. Now we can go ahead and talk about a little bit more maybe about uh, Netlify. So we will use Netlify to host our application and then also use it to run these serverless functions locally. So Netlify has a Netlify CLI, which is really nice for being able to run your, your, um, your serverless functions locally and be able to test them. And that's what we're going to do. And it works really nicely. So you will need to go ahead and install the Netlify CLI globally on your machine. So run NPM install Netlify CLI, and you'll have that for us to then run here in a second. So let's see how I think I've got some, I think those errors are okay that, that are in there. This should be wrapping up here in a second and then uh, we'll get started. All right, so that finished installing and I'm going to open that up inside of VS Code and then close down this one. All right, so if we were to run this, we could do npm run start and what we'll see is it's just a basic React application. I'm assuming at this point, uh, you probably have some basic React experience, otherwise a lot of this will be pretty new to you. But what we really wanna see is how to use Netlify serverless functions. So to do this, what we're going to do is create a directory called functions. This is, as you might expect, where all of our functions will live. And then I'm gonna create a hello world JS and a serverless function is a file that exports a handler. So exports.handler equals, and then it has three properties, event, context, and call back. So this is um, your each individual endpoint or serverless function is literally just a function definition. And in this case, I'm marking it async. And then uh, you can return a status code or an object with a status code of 200 and then a body with a message of hello world, maybe something like that. So that is your first serverless function, which is uh, pretty nice. And then we need to now run this. So usually we would run Netlify dev as the command, but uh, we need to create a configuration uh, to tell Netlify how to run this stuff locally. So this will be a Netlify TOML file. And I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna cheat and just kind of grab a copy of the this over here just to kind of show how it works and uh, what we define is this build command and then a functions property which is going to tell netlify where our our actual serverless functions live so with the netlify netlify cli installed we can run netlify dev and this should start up our lambda server at three four five six seven as well as it'll actually run the front end part, which is React, which is pretty nice. So with our serverless function in place, we can actually go to slash dot Netlify slash functions slash, and then the name of that file, which in that case was hello world. And I think I forgot one thing inside, I always forget this, uh, we should stringify this object so anything you return out of here if you want to return json you have to actually send it back as a string in the body so save that and refresh uh, this page and hopefully now we'll see an object comes back with hello world super cool so that is our base serverless function and what we're going to do is end up creating a serverless function for each one of the crud interactions inside of fauna db one for creating updating deleting and uh what are getting all of the links out of our fauna db database. So let's come back into Fauna. And one of the things we're going to need is a secret key that we can use to interact in Fauna. So under the security tab of your database, 
you'll wanna create a new key and then inside of here, make sure you uh, grab a server key. So these are keys that we can use on a server. Ironic because we're working with serverless functions. Serverless doesn't mean there is no server. It means we, the developers, don't care about the server. We don't have to maintain it or do anything with it. That server is just given to us. So uh, inside of this key name, let's, uh, let's just call this, it doesn't really matter. Um, test key doesn't really matter what you call it and click save, and you'll want to grab this secret key. Now I'm gonna get rid of this key by the time you watch this video, so you won't be able to hack my stuff, but copy this, save it somewhere, because after you move off of this page, you'll never see this again, this won't be displayed. So copy it now, and then what we're going to do is come over to our project, and we're gonna add a .env file. Now .env files are made for uh, environment variables that you want to pull into your application. Typically, these are things that you want to be secret. In this case, the uh, secret key for Fauna. So the way you create key value pairs in here is you give it the name of uh, the key, the name of the thing that you want to access, the key here. Usually these are all uppercase and then separated by underscores. That's just kind of how it is. And then the last part here is uh, the actual value of the thing. So uh, I'm going to uh, save this. I'm also going to make sure inside of my .getignore, anytime you add .env files, you want to make sure that you ignore them so that they don't get checked into your source code. Make sure you hear me. Don't check these into your source code. All right, so uh, we've got our .env. Now that means that we can actually use this thing inside of our serverless functions. So let's do, uh, let's maybe create a getter for getting all of our links out of FaunaDB. So let's go into uh, functions and let's do a new file. Let's say get uh, links.js. And same thing, this will be exports.handler equals uh, what async. And then the only parameter I need is the event. So I can actually define my function this way. So to be able to interact with FaunaDB, what we're basically going to do is send the GraphQL query in a REST request, an HTTP request to Fauna. To do that, we're going to need to install uh, Axios as a package. It's a package for making HTTP requests easier. And then to work with our environment variables, we're going to uh, use the .env package as well. This will take the properties out of this .env file and let us access them inside of our application. So I'm going to install both of those. And then for specifically for, uh, well, for both of these, so one with Axios, we will require Axios and then just get it that way. And then for .env, we'll say const, or actually we'll just say require .env.config. This will grab, set it up to grab all those environment properties, uh, grab them and then put them inside of our application so that we can use them. Whew. So, all right, what we want to do is uh, create an actual query to be able to send uh, over to GraphQL. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to grab the link queries and grab the get links query. And uh, there's no reason for me to really write all of these over and over again. So this is why I'm just kind of copying and pasting them in. So this is, oh, not that. This is the query that we are going to use to get all of the links out of FaunaDB. And if you notice, this looks a lot like the query that we actually wrote right inside of FaunaDB. So you can go and experiment inside of FaunaDB, the, the uh, query thingy there. And then uh, you can just copy that into uh, here. So we're using this get links query. And then what we want to do is create an Axios request where we're going to pass in uh, this uh, query and any variables that we need. So this will look like, uh, we'll await, we're using um, async await in here, we'll call Axios, and we need to tell it what the URL is that we're trying to request. Now this is one of the interesting things about Fauna is the GraphQL API endpoint is the same for everyone. The difference is, um, is the secret key that comes along with it. And we use this secret key with uh, as an, a bearer token. And what this means is we'll have headers, 
will have inside of that a proper property of bearer. And then I'm going to use ES6 template literals because you have bearer and then the actual secret key. Now remember we use environment variables and we configured all this to use our uh, environment variable so that we could do something like process.env and then the key that we want to use or the variable that we want to use, which in this case is fauna secret key. Okay, so we're building up our requests with these headers. Uh, this one will be, uh, I guess they all need to be a post. So this is going to be a post method. All right. And then we also need to include the data in here. So data is going to include the query that we wrote above. So that thing is called the get, uh, what did we call that? Get links up there. So we'll say query equals get links. And then the variables property, uh, in this case will just be an empty object. We're not uh, doing a mutation. A mutation would take data going in. We're not doing that. We're just making a query. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, one, we can surround all of this with a try, or actually, uh, I think this thing will come back with error. So let's just uh, look at, I think this thing is going to come back with a data property. And so let's do this. Let's just log out console log that data that comes back. And what I'm doing is destructuring uh, the data property from the response that comes back. So then we want to log this thing out and let's just uh, return status code of 200 and this should be an object still sorry about this uh status code of 200 and then the body uh let's stringify the uh data that we're logging out there all right so hopefully what we'll see is we can get data back here so let's run netlify dev and uh we'll see this run this thing is running there. And what we want to do is head on over to not the hello world function, but the get links function. And we'll see what happens. Uh, actually cool. That came back with data and then all links and data. Remember that from inside of our GraphQL query. Uh, where is it? Yeah. So over here, data, all links, data that comes back. Well, uh, perfect. And then it has the actual information in it, which is great. So this is able to query all of the links out of fauna DB. Now a little tip here in Netlify, uh, you have to type .netlify slash functions each time. And honestly, that kind of sucks. And so you can simplify this a little bit. I'm just going to copy in this little snippet here. So this little snippet is in the cheat sheet that I mentioned inside of this uh, serverless functions cheat sheet. You can go and grab for free. And it will show you how to uh, redirect everything from an a, a slash API call to the full netlify slash functions slash splat, which kind of means whatever comes after that. So... Um, I'm going to restart Netlify dev. And what we should be able to do once this is up and running is inside of here. Now stop opening up. Uh, we can get rid of net dot Netlify slash functions and just do slash API get links. And that should do the same thing. Sweet. This is a lot easier. I recommend setting this up every time you do this. So in this case, we're able to uh, query all of this stuff, but really we want to simplify this a little bit because we're going to end up doing the same sort of thing for each one of these serverless functions that we have, create, read, update, and delete. And so uh, inside of functions, I'm going to create a utils uh, directory. Inside of there, I'm going to have a send query JS. And then I want to copy a lot of this stuff over. So I'm going to grab this whole thing here. All right, and I'm gonna get get it out of there. So let's copy it and let's come over to send query. And we're gonna say module.exports. What's we're doing what we're doing is exporting a function that can be called from each one of the endpoints that we have, the serverless functions that we have. And so this thing is gonna take a query and variables. And then inside of here, uh, we're gonna do a similar thing. But we're going to take in this query and we're going to send the query. So we'll do that a little shorthand in ESX. And then uh, we will send the variables along as well. Now we need to import Axios again. So const Axios equals require Axios. And then we'll want to, want to make sure we require our .env and call config on it. So we are exporting this thing. And what I want to do is I want to grab the data property off of the data property, if that makes sense. 
and then also grab the errors property. This way we can check to see whether or not there were any errors inside of here. And this actually looks like this. So this is gonna say it's gonna grab the, da the response data on that thing, it's gonna have a data property and an errors property, which may or may not actually have errors. And then inside of here, what I wanna do is check if errors, if there are any errors, I'm going to log them out. And then I'm going to throw an error. So throw new error, uh, something went wrong. Not being super specific here. And in the end, I'm not returning uh, from a serverless function, I'm just actually returning this data. So there is our send query. Now, uh, another thing we can do is we can create a new file of all of our queries. So we can call this link queries uh, JS. And I'm going to copy over this get links. And then I'm going to say module.exports equals a function that, th or not a function, an object that has all of the queries that we are going to use inside of it. So there's our get links query. There is our send query. So here's the thing that we will pass a query to as well as variables. And then inside of get links, we can uh, change up all of this stuff to go and grab. So const get links. We want to import that thing from our dot slash utils and then link query. So we want to grab the actual query out of that. And uh, this is the totally wrong syntax. This should be a require instead of the import syntax I was trying to use. That was totally wrong. So we want to get that thing. And then we also want to get the send query function from our other utils. Did I not type that in right? Dot slash utils. There we go and uh, send query. So now that we are importing the query and the ability to send the query, now we can just call this thing. So we can surround it with a try catch in case anything goes wrong. We will uh, call await uh, send query and pass in the get, oops, the get links query. Remember that's just a GraphQL string. Then we will say const data equals res.alllinks.data. It's kind of just how you grab that information off the response. And then we'll return a status code, status code of 200, and then a body of json.stringify uh, data. All right, and I think the only thing we're missing is a catch down here. And if something goes wrong, we will uh, log out that error and get rid of the brackets there. And then uh, we will return a status code of 500 and then a body of uh, JSON string of five. Not being too specific here, but uh, just kind of giving an error message back to the user. So we've now uh, made this stuff look a little bit uh, a little bit better because we've got send query in its own file. And then we've got all of, or not all of them yet, the link queries in its own file. Now we can reference this and the individual serverless function gets a lot easier. One of the things that I think is useful is I'm gonna create a formatted response JS file. And I'm going to say that uh, this is going to be a function that will take in a status and a body and then I'm going to return the thing that you have to do in serverless functions, which is return uh, the status code. And actually I'll rename this to status code. So we'll return the status code and then a body equals JSON stringify of the actual body. Now what I'm doing is I don't like writing this JSON stringify thing every time. So what I'm gonna do is in each one of these, I'm going to Im not import, but say const uh, format uh, and actually yeah, I guess formatted, that's fine. I could come up with a better name, but just say formatted response equals require, and then in our utils, formatted response. And then what we'll do is we'll just return formatted response and pass in uh, these two parameters. Does that work? Formatted response and pass in parameters instead of an object. Okay, so it should be a little bit simpler, hopefully you see. And then we'll do the same thing down here, formatted response of 500 and then uh, an error 
message something went wrong. All right, that's just a little preference of mine. Again, this is in that little cheat sheet that I talked about, the Netlify serverless functions cheat sheet, uh, something that I enjoy doing. So hopefully after all of that restructuring and formatting, what we'll see is uh, we should basically see the same thing. This should come back or slightly more formatted. This should come back with all of the data that we need, which is really great. All right, so we've got all of uh, all the ability, all the organization around this to be able to query links. Now I wanna go into link queries and let's add a, I'm gonna grab link uh, queries. I'm gonna grab the snippet for creating a link and then we'll just copy it in. And again, you have access to the source code so you can go and do the same thing. Well, let's copy in uh, the create link and then let's export it as well. And the uh, create link is a mutation. So in this case, what we're gonna do is pass information to this query. We're gonna pass a name property, a URL property, a description property, and then it will call the create link mutation and it will pass in each one of these variables as the values that are needed to create that thing. Now, if that didn't make sense, inside of GraphQL Playground, under create link, uh, we will have, uh, if you look at the example here, it's we're hard coding information to pass in as the data. Now we're taking these in as parameters, which are in the variable section of what we're working with. So that is our create link query that we will also export. Inside of our functions, let's go ahead and create our create link function. And in this case, I'm going to uh, copy get links. I'm gonna copy everything out of here and come back over to create links. And in this case, instead of get links, we want the create link query. Then, we want to uh, send query. We want to send the create link query. And we also want to grab information from the body. So this is information that's submitted from React and we want to grab it here. So we grab the body by saying JSON stringify of event.body. So it comes in as a string and instead of stringify, we actually want to parse that string. So it is a string. We want to parse it into a body object. And then from there, from that body, I wanna grab the properties of name, URL, description, okay? So there is, those are the properties that we need. And then we'll just say const variables equals name, URL, description. And we'll create an archived property of false. So we'll go ahead and set that to false by default. All right, so there is our list of variables and we wanna pass them inside of here. And I think the response that comes back, let's double check this, create link. Uh, the thing that comes back is going to be a little bit different. So instead of our uh, res right here, we'll actually just grab the create link property. Now create link property, if you look over here, is going to be the actual object that comes back to us. So it's called create link, but I like created link. So I know this is something that I did create. So created link in here, um, I'm basically just renaming this. So the create link property, I'm renaming to created link. And then that's the thing that I actually wanna return. So we can uh, return in here, created link. All right. Hopefully all that stuff looks good. Now, the way we test this is we have to open up something like Postman or insomnia is another one. I've always used Postman and I enjoy using that. So we'll need to go into Postman to test out these uh, requests. All right, you can see I've actually uh, been testing inside of here before. Do I have a post? Yeah, I've actually got this up. So uh, I'm gonna send a, re a post request to the localhost 8888 Netlify functions. You could also simplify this with API because of that configuration that we created. And uh, we'll say this is the create link. And then inside of the body, we will have um, our link here. Let's just say HTTPS uh, colon colon uh, James website again. That's fine. And um, we'll just say James website again description. Doesn't really matter what all that stuff is. So we're sending a post request to our serverless function, create link, and then we're including the information that we need, the URL, the name, and the description. So I like, we'll see, let's test this out, let's run it, and let's see what happens. 
hopefully what comes back is an actual object, although it looks like this is not coming back. I wonder if we've got anything in here. It says uh, 404 for create link. And I think the problem here is when you add a new uh, function inside of your functions directory, Netlify dev doesn't capture that thing or know it's there necessarily. So I think we just need to restart our Netlify dev. So let's get that a second to get up and running. I don't need this tab. Let's try this again inside of here. Uh, we see that that comes back, sweet. And uh, hopefully that means that it's been created. If we then go, and we can just come and do this in the browser, uh, if we refresh, now we should see there's multiple links here, which is sweet. That's pretty cool, I think. So we have the ability to create links now we need to finish out our CRUD operations with update and delete. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit of copying again for these queries, just because they're kind of tedious to paste in. And what I'm going to do is actually paste in the entire file. So, and then we'll talk about it. So I'm going to get rid of all of this and paste in the new stuff. So the only thing that's different is we still have our get links query. We had that before. We still have our create link query. Now we've got update and delete. So these should look pretty familiar with you. Update in this case is gonna take in all of the properties, ID, archive, or yeah, ID, archive, ID, because it already exists and it has an ID property. Name, URL, description. And then just the same way that we called create link, in this case we call update link and pass in those pieces of data, the ID and then the data itself. Same exact thing. Now we're just updating instead of creating. Delete link is actually a lot simpler. To delete link, uh, all you need is the ID, and then you call delete link, and you can pass back the ID of the thing that you deleted. Really not too bad. And then we export all of that stuff. So now that we have all of those queries in place, we can now create our two additional functions, serverless functions that we need. Uh, one is our up update link.js, and then we will also need our delete link, delete link. J S I'm going to uh, cheat a little bit again. I'm going to grab everything out of the create link. I'm going to go into update link and do that. I'm going to, the only real thing we need to update, I think is let's just replace. And if you select that information and inside of VS code, um, do a find, you can pull down the replace and update this to update link and uh, let's go ahead and replace both of those. So now we're getting the update link query. We are sending that query. So now in our body, we want to get all of the different pieces of information about this link. So we'll get name, URL, description, and then also we want the ID as well as the archived. And then we'll want to update the variables to include that information. So we'll put in the ID as well as archived is already in there. So that should be everything. And you might be wondering, why don't I just parse this body and then send that body instead of destructuring these and then rebuilding an object? The problem is I want to make sure that someone submitting information is not sending any additional information that we don't need. So I want to strip out everything we don't need, just grab the stuff that we do and these things and then pass them along in the variables. So then it uh, looks like uh, instead of create link, I probably want to update this to update link. And then I'm renaming that variable to updated link and then we pass in the variables and uh, the query and then we return back the updated updated link okay so let's uh make sure we restart this we need to do that so let's restart and what we need is actually this entire object so let's grab one of these not that stop popping open it's one of the nice things about React with the live reloading server, but when you don't need that landing page to jump up, it's kind of inconvenient. So uh, inside of here, uh, we actually want to pass this entire data, piece of data, this entire object. And again, this includes an ID and uh, this should be update link. And I'm not gonna do any specific checking, but I want this to be a put request. So usually your updates are either put or patch. Uh, I'm gonna make this a put request, although I'm not, um, verifying it on the back end. Anyway, you could add that if you wanted. And uh, inside of here, here's all the properties. And let's just say uh, James website uh, updated link. So we've got the name has changed here to updated link. 
and let's just give it a shot. Let's test this out. Hopefully, oh, something went wrong. Okay, fair enough. So let's see uh, what we got here. Update link, expected value of type ID, but value is undefined, okay? So let's look at the link query again. And this updated part, actually we pass in, uh, the update link takes the property of regular ID instead of underscore ID. I wonder if this is, let's check this. So update link and uh, inside of here. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just called the regular ID here. Not actually really sure why that is, but that's okay. So we'll make sure to rename in our update when we get the ID, we will then rename this thing to ID. This is a neat little trick in here. And then we'll pass the actual ID property, no underscore. So let's see what we got. Let's uh, refresh. Uh, this auto refresh, did you catch that? Did I talk about that with Netlify dev? Pretty sweet. Uh, we'll do another suite. So that looked like it worked. Now let's do our query inside of here again, and we'll see updated links. So our update is working. What? That's cool. So lastly, uh, we need our delete. And I just copied one of those uh, IDs and I'm going to, um, I guess I just copy all this stuff again. Let's come into delete link. Let's update the update link. Let us uh, search for that and let's uh, replace it with delete link. All right, so let's save that. And then the return information coming out of here or actually the request mainly is gonna be a little bit different. So from, from here, we wanna grab the ID property. Actually, we'll just, well, from the front end, we'll just pass this in as regular ID. So I uh, will grab the ID property from the body. So json.parse event.body. All right, and then I think we got an extra line there. We don't need, actually we do need variables because we still, we're gonna pass in that ID. So we'll pass in the ID here. And then I thought, did we not uh, update? Maybe we didn't do this. Let's now do it. Now we've got delete link instead of update link. And so we'll pass in delete link query, and then we'll pass back the, uh, or pass in the variables as well. And then what comes back for this is, from this is delete, delete link, because that's the name of the mutation. And then I'm going to call this deleted, deleted link ID. And um, yeah, that should be fine. So let's just, uh, Let's just return back an object with an ID of, and actually we'll just call this, um, well, no, that's fine. So uh, we'll return back an object that has deleted link ID. So we should delete the link, we send the query, we pass in the ID that we want to delete. Uh, hopefully that thing will delete it. It will give us back the delete link property, which is an object of an ID. Oh, actually it already is an object that has, yeah, it should be, yeah, that should actually already already be something. So let's just call this deleted link because that thing is already an object. And then we'll just return that thing. Let's see, deleted link like that. All right, but remember we added the new function, although it, we already created the file, so maybe it already knows about it. Anyway, we'll restart Netlify dev just to be sure that delete link is coming up okay. And then what I wanna do is come back to Postman we will do a delete request and we'll send in um, an ID like this. This is regular ID. I know these are kind of um, confusing, but this is regular ID and we'll send a delete link and call delete link and send. ID comes back. If we then query back in our browser, we should see one less link. One less link, sweet. We're able to delete links, that's cool. So now we've got all of the CRUD operations uh, in place. One of the things you might wanna do, I'm gonna copy this over because it's not super important, but uh, if you wanted to enforce that people are using the right HTTP methods inside of your code, you could do something like this, so formatted response. So you could say, if this HTTP method is not delete, then send back, um, an error message that says that this method is not supported. So you could do that for this one. 
You could do the same thing for the update in here. So you could check it like this and say, if this isn't a put, say method not supported. So you can go and add some extra things in here. But all of our serverless function stuff is working to do CRUD operations with FaunaDB. And again, all of this started, if you remember, from uh, the... Actually, I guess I don't have it in here. Let me grab it again from this other side. It is that links GraphQL file. So we created, or you created a database inside um, of FaunaDB. And then all you did was add this GraphQL definition and boom, you've got an entire database where you can go and do all the CRUD operations that we needed to. Pretty sweet, I think. So we'll take a second and just kind of think about how cool that is. And then from here, we've got all the information that we need. We can kind of close out our back end, and now we can work in our front front end, not front end, but our front end. And uh, let me grab, uh, let me think for a second what all we need to do in here inside of the front end. Uh, we're going to use Bootstrap, so we'll just in install Bootstrap there. And let me look at what else uh, we might need. We need Bootstrap. And we already have Axios, so we can use that. And I think that's it that we need on the React side. So let's install those things. And I'm going to open up the app.js file. So we're not going to get too much into like structuring our code and stuff in here. Not going to think too much about that. What I am going to do is uh, get rid of all of the boilerplate stuff in React. I don't need a logo there. I don't actually need the app CSS. We can get rid of that too. And then inside of here, um, I want to start off with a container. And then uh, let's have, we can add some extra padding. Now these are bootstrap utility classes, which are pretty sweet. So PY5 is going to add padding of the Y, the vertical axis of five rem, I think is what it becomes. And then I'll add a title in here with a couple of classes um, of text center, MB5, margin bottom five. And then uh, we'll call this list O links, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to put, um, actually maybe I'll, uh, I was going to say put a couple of comments. We need to uh, grab all of the links. We need to display all of the links and then add delete and archive functionality. That's kind of what, what we're going to be doing in the front end. Cool. So that works. The one thing we need, or the first thing we need to do is go ahead and grab all of those links and we're going to use a use effect hook. We're going to use hooks inside of functional components inside of react. So use effect will allow us to uh, decide when we want to go and load the links when we start the application, at least to start. And then the use state will be able to track those links inside of state, as you might imagine. So uh, let's do import from React, and then we'll import use effect and use state. And uh, inside of here, we will uh, create a function. Let's create a load links function it's an asynchronous function and it doesn't take any parameters and what it's going to do is just make that request to uh, the back end that we just created so it should make a request to api slash get links cool uh, inside of here um, i'm actually just using the fetch api we could use axios here but we could just use fetch since it's built into front end browser javascript so we will uh, fetch fetch slash API slash get links. All right, that's cool. And then from that response, uh, we will get um, links and then we'll say await res.json. So uh, res.json will take that response and it will convert it or get the body object out of it uh, by converting it to JSON. And then let's just start by logging out these links. Uh, oh, but what, so we've defined that function. Now we need to actually call it using use effect. So uh, this thing will be a function that has zero dependencies. So this dependency array is when this function should be triggered based on something inside of that array changing. We pass nothing. So this will basically just run one time at the beginning of our component. And then we'll call load links. All right, we'll just call that function. And to run all of this, again, we run Netlify dev because Netlify dev will run our serverless functions as well as our front end. And it looked like that I have an error in here. Uh, 405, 404. Oh, this is just kind of information. Okay, that's fine. Uh, on inside of here, say res.json is not a function. That's because 
Uh, we didn't actually call fetch on this thing. We just passed it a URL and we actually need to call fetch. So fetch is built in uh, to JavaScript. We should see this thingy and let's get out of here, go to our console. Hopefully we see an array of one and we see our links. We've only got one, but at least we're able to see it. So that's pretty sweet. And I want, um, I want this H1. Did I grab? I would have thought that text center would have centered that thing, but it doesn't look like it is. And I don't think this is picking up bootstrap. Let's see side of here. Did we install bootstrap? We did. Oh, I think there's one thing we need to do inside of our index JS and that's to actually import all of the bootstrap CSS. So let's go to index file and then make sure that you import all the bootstrap CSS. Now they also have like bootstrap components. I'm not getting into all that. You can uh, look into that if you want. I'm not, not worried about it. We're just using regular bootstrap classes here. Now this should look a little bit better. So now we can actually go and start to display these things and to keep track of the links, we need to have a piece of state for them. So uh, to use use state, uh, you do this. So links and set links equals use state. And we'll start off with an empty array. So we're calling use state, which returns back uh, an array of two things. The first is like the property itself. The second is a function to call to update it. And then you pass it the initial um, the initial value, which is just an array. So what we'll do is we'll set links to the uh, links that come back there. So we'll uh, do that. And then we don't need to log it out anymore. And that should be our load links. Now we could also uh, surround this with a try catch. So uh, just a good habit to get into. If something goes wrong, uh, we could log out whatever. And that's kind of it. You do more like probably display an error to the user or something. But um, for, for now, I think that's good. So now inside of our, um, our app, we want to display these links. So I'm going to create a link, uh, link list component that we haven't created yet, but I'm going to go ahead and import it. So import link, uh, list from uh, components directory and then link list. So. Uh, inside of here, we'll create our components directory. This should actually be inside of the source directory here. And then inside of there, we'll create our link list JS. I've got some snippets to do a react functional component. You should check out those snippets inside of VS code. And here it is. So inside of here, we want to pass a, uh, an object called links. And then we actually want to like iterate through each of those links and display the different pieces of information that, um, that we need. So, um, inside of here we'll have, um, let's see, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll just walk through. I want to, I want to differentiate between links that are archived and not. So I want to separate those out, but for now we'll start, uh, by saying H2 and we'll say, these are the links we can add a little bit of uh, classes to it. Uh, so we'll just add some vertical um, margin. So we'll do that. And then we'll say, if there are links, then we'll iterate through. So links.map. And for each link, what do we want to return? Well, we want to return a div with a class of card. And then inside of that, we want to actually uh, display each of these things. But what we could do is we could even get a little fancier and we could actually display a link card component like this. And let's import that we haven't created yet, but uh, we will use a link card component, import it from link card. And now let's go and create that thing. So we'll have our link card JS, uh, RFC for stubbing out a React component. And inside of here is where we want to actually display this thing. So we'll have a class name of card and this component will accept a property of not card, but link. And then now we want to actually display that thing. So uh, we'll have a display of card, then we'll have a card header. The card header will have uh, just the link 
dot name. So that'll be the header there. And then we'll have the card body. All right. Inside of that, we'll have the uh, link dot description. And then we will also have an H ref uh, that's gonna point to the link dot URL. And then uh, this is actually, we just say the text is gonna be link dot URL as well. So we're displaying the name as the header, the uh, link itself and the description in the body. And then inside of the card footer, we wanna have two different buttons, one for archiving a link and one for deleting. So we'll say a button with a class of button and button warning and margin right to. It's kind of fancy stuff using Emmet uh, inside of VS Code. So you can type all this stuff out if you want to, but I would recommend trying out some of these snippets. They're pretty cool. So we'll have an archive button and then we'll have a button with button and button danger. Is that right? Yeah, button danger. And uh, this thing will be the delete button. All right, so there's how we display the card. Now from our link list, we want to call uh, link card. Uh, that looks right, why is that giving me an error? Uh, for each one of these, we want to have a link card and we wanna pass in the link itself like this. What error is that giving me? Uh, we don't actually need these brackets, I don't think. So it should be an implicit return, all right. So for each one of the links, we want to return a link card and then uh, we can also uh, say the key, something you have to do in React is the link dot ID. All right, uh, interesting. Let's see how far we are down here. So we've got our link list and we'll pass in the links and pass it in like that. And is that right in link list? Yeah, we pass in links. Yeah, let's see if that works. Whoa, it worked. So here's our one link. We're able to pull all of that information inside of our app JS, we're able to pass it into linked link list, not linked list, and then display all of those links by using a link card for each one of them. Now from here, one of the things we want to do, we want to actually add the functionality for this archive and delete button. And those are kind of interesting for each one of those, they need to make a request uh, to the API to be able to archive and delete. So we'll create an archive link uh, function and uh, this thing will need to, like I said, make a request uh, to the API to actually uh, archive it. So we'll pass in, uh, actually we have a reference to the link already. So we'll say, uh, we'll grab that link and we'll say link.archived, archived equals um, true. So we'll basically just archive that object. And then we wanna send that thing to our backend. So we'll do a try catch get a little snippet there. And uh, we'll use the fetch API again. So fetch and then uh, dots or just slash API slash update link. And then in here we can figure how we're going to send this request. So the first thing is we define the method of put. And then we say the body is uh, JSON stringify of that link. So we send that in as the body. And actually I think we just send it in that way. Let's look, oh, this should be an async function. Let's look in our uh, update link. Uh, this should just grab the body directly, yeah. So uh, we'll pass in that link. And if there's an error, again, not really doing a whole lot here other than just saying, ah, uh, error, whatever, error. Oh, this is spelled out all the way. So archive link is just going to update the archived property of that link and then send it off to the API to update it. And then the other one is gonna be const delete link. And this is going to be an async function as well. And for here, what we wanna do is we wanna say const ID equals uh, link dot underscore ID. So we get the ID property. And then, I, can I just copy this? Are y'all okay with that? If I just copy all of this stuff and uh, we'll make the request to delete link and we'll make this delete and we'll pass in, I think we'll need to pass an object uh, that has a property of ID. And uh, cool, so that should make that delete request to the serverless function that we created earlier. Now we need to wire each of these up to our buttons. So on click, on click is going to be archive link 
and then delete link. All right. So that's cool. We've got our archive link and our delete link. Um, those should be wired up. Now, the thing that we're not going to actually notice though is or maybe we won't notice is the actual update. So what we want to do is inside of our app.js anytime or from our link card, anytime something is updated or deleted, we want to tell our app.js to refresh those links. So uh, this is going to get a little bit ugly. I would probably use like the context API to make this a little bit simpler, but uh, we'll call this, um, we'll pass in a function to refresh or to link list called refresh links. And this is going to uh, call inside of our app.js, the load links. All right, so then inside of our link list, this is going to uh, get refresh links, which we will then pass to the, uh, the link card and that'll be the same property. So it'll refresh links. And from the link card, we want to accept the, <laughs> Uh, the refresh links, oops, not that here. So that will be a property that comes in. And then after we archive and after we delete, we want to call uh, the refresh links. Hopefully that makes sense. That's a little bit tedious, I think. Again, I could optimize this a little bit, but we're just trying to say after we update or archive a link or delete a link, just go back to the front until it's a refresh, all right? Another thing I wanna do, and uh, I know this is getting to be a lot, is inside of the link list, I want to separate this into uh, links and archive links. So I'm going to uh, copy and paste this, and this bottom one is archived links. And right in line here, we can do a filter on our links. And uh, for our filter, this top one, we want to get ones that are not archived. So for link, we want to return uh, link is not archived. And then on the bottom, and if you're not familiar with um, like array filter and map, filter will return back a new array, which you can then map over to display stuff. Uh, so on, I want to do the same thing here, except this should be if the link is archived. So, and then we'll call it dot map. Whew. All right, we're doing a lot here. So inside of here, we see we've got our, our links. Uh, we've got one and it is not archived. And then if we press archive, hopefully what happens is it actually went and archived and now it updated because we triggered back in the app.js to refresh all of our links. Now we see our archived links as a separate list, pretty sweet. And then hopefully if we delete a link, we should see it went away completely. So all of that is working. The only thing we're missing now is to actually create a link. So let's uh, go into our component and let's say link form JS and stub this out with RFC. And I'm gonna put this thing inside of a card as well. And then I'll have card header is uh, add link. And then the card body will be the actual form. And we don't need an action there. All right, this is not necessarily a React tutorial, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm gonna grab the form that's already created because this should be, this is not really the focus of what we're doing. But for this form, inside of it, we're gonna have an input and this is using like form groups with bootstrap classes and stuff. But inside of this, uh, we're gonna have a uh, label and an input for the name here. A label and an input for the uh, URL, a label and an input text area for description, and then we'll have our submit button. I think we got uh, this div should be closing form tag. Does that look right? No, that should, sorry, that one should be the closing of the card body, and then we have the closing form tag. Does that look right? Maybe not. Oh, this thing should have been a form from the beginning. I don't know why that wasn't. So I think these, this one should now be a div. Did I get, am I still not right on these tags? All right, let's look. So here is our form and card body. That looks okay. Oh, it looks like I just mistyped that one. So that should be closing div there. All right. 
Uh, so there's our form. Again, don't worry too much about the React part of that. It's just kind of, it is what it is. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy you a couple of things additional to this. Oh, actually we'll go ahead and type them out. So we want to uh, use the use state. So we want to track the state here. And we wanna have one for name and set name equals use state. It's gonna start off as an empty string. Uh, then we'll have a couple of different properties, one for the URL, empty string as well. And then we'll have the description, description if we can spell it, and the uh, description right here. And that's gonna start off as an empty string as well. And then I've got a, a reset form, reset form function equals uh, this, to just reset all of these values. So after we submit, we'll reset all of these things to empty values and then uh, set URL. All right, so there's the reset form function. And then we want our const handle submit like this. This is going to take in an event. And the first thing we do is call e.preventDefault. All right, so there's the start of it. And if you look in here, notice that I've already wired up the value in the on change. So this will make sure that we're tracking each of those properties inside of React. Now what we want to do is actually send uh, the body to uh, our API. So uh, we'll grab the body by combining the three properties, name, URL, and description. All right, and then we'll do our try catch and we'll use uh, the fetch API to uh, go ahead and send this stuff over to our serverless functions. So we'll say const res equals await fetch. And then we're sending this to API slash create link, just our regular endpoint there. This will have a method of post and then the body will be the stringified version of our body. All right. And uh, hopefully that thing works. We need to mark this as a sync. And if it does, we actually want to do a similar thing to what we just did um, inside of our other stuff. We want to call refresh links like this. Uh, so we'll need to, one, get rid of the semicolon because I didn't go there. But we'll need to accept that as a property, refresh links. Um, and then right before we do that, let's actually clear out the input. So we'll call reset form. All right, hopefully this form is working. Then we need to uh, come into our app.js and let's use this thing. So here's our list of links. We'll start up here with the link form. I'm gonna get some IntelliSense here from VS Code. And then let's pass in the refresh links equals load links. Whew. All right, let's see what we got now. So here's our form. We'll say James website, HTTPS, www, uh, colon, colon, www jamesqquick.com. Uh, this is the coolest site ever. Hopefully what we'll see is this should submit. It should submit successfully, wipe out the form, and then add the link to the list of links below. So submit, eek. Sweet, that looks like it worked. Uh, let's actually grab the uh, Netlify serverless functions cheat sheet. Let's do this. Netlify functions cheat sheet. I've already done this once. There it is. This is an awesome cheat sheet. Uh, submit this. Now it should come down to links again and uh, we can archive one of these and it should come down here. We can also delete it. It should go away completely. And it looks like all of our CRUD functionality is working uh, in this Jamstack application, which we can now set up to deploy to Netlify. Now, the only thing I'm gonna do here is inside of Netlify, I've already got my repo created, so I'm not gonna use this existing repo, but what you would need to do is add this to a GitHub repository. So connect this to GitHub. Once you do, come to Netlify, and uh, we're just gonna create a new site here, a new site from Git and GitHub, and then this will go and make sure that you're able to do that. So yeah, you're okay to go to GitHub, authorized, and inside of here, now, uh, let's say, uh, what did I call? I can't remember what I called the original source code. Build a full stack app with React Serverless and FaunaDB. 
we'll grab that thing. When we run this, or when we deploy, what we want to do is run the npm run build command. And this will be a build command uh, for React. So uh, just do that run. And then actually I need to double check. When we run the build command, where do those files go? So the output of that build command goes in the build directory. You can see that popped up up here. So that's where we wanna serve our stuff from, this build directory. So we wanna run this build command and then serve the files from the build and show advanced. Uh, we also wanna add environment variables, so inside of Netlify. So uh, let's grab the .env file, grab your fauna secret key. You should have it in your .env file. Let's add that value in here and let's call this fauna secret key. So there's the, the one environment variable that we need. Works well in uh, Netlify to add those. And then let's just deploy this thing. And what this should do is it, it should go and grab all of the latest source code from your GitHub repository. So make sure you connect your code to GitHub, create the repository, connect it, and then add, um, like commit or push all of your changes to GitHub. What this will do is it will go and grab all of those files. It will run a build uh, react build to grab the output of those files and it will take those and it will host them and it will also grab all of the functions out of the functions directory for you to use. So I'm going to uh, pause here and we'll let this finish up and then we'll come back and take a look. So actually this just finished and we had an error. This is actually new for me. So I figured I might show you and it looks like react is treating warnings as errors when the CI property is set to true. So continuous integration, that's kind of the automated process that all this stuff goes through. So what I'm gonna do is from my other monitor on the original source code, I just pushed it to the GitHub repo. What that should do, and you'll see this from now on, is when you uh, push your code, it should trigger another build inside of Netlify. So we will see, one thing to actually show you here is um, it says different functions path detected uh, functions versus nothing in the Netlify UI. So inside of that Netlify TOML file that we created so that we could help run stuff locally, when it gets deployed, Netlify will look at that file and kind of figure out uh, what to do with it in terms of how to host and, and where your functions and things are. So it's doing that for us. Uh, it's detected that thing, which is really nice. And I'm gonna let this build finish and see if this one works and see if we're good to go. All right, so that just took a little bit to finish. Uh, it says to me, actually, hopefully you see the same thing. Site is live, so it did the React build. It's hosting those serverless functions. And hopefully, what we'll see is inside of the site, which we can go to, Netlify gives you a random name that you can use, Brave New Man, something, something. All right, and when we open this up, it looks like it's not working because we don't see the links coming here. And actually, if I refresh, just to show you this, uh, when it makes a request to the get links endpoint, that actually seems to fail. And uh, I think this is a little bit of a weird thing that I haven't quite figured out. So I'll give you a way to fix this. But the redirects that we set up to use that slash API for some reason uh, aren't working when deployed inside of Netlify. So what we're going to do is go back in the source code and change our reference in React from slash API to slash dot Netlify slash function. So we'll just go back through and update it that way and then redeploy and hopefully we should be okay. All right, so I'm going to go inside of VS Code. I'm going to close all these out, and I am going to just do a global search in here for slash API. And you'll see uh, we're doing this in four different locations here, 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 and here. So what I'll do is I'll just do a global replace. So instead of slash API, I want slash dot Netlify slash functions, um, and then that should be good. So let's go ahead and update all of these. And I'm gonna get this up and running again, just to make sure these are still working. So I'm gonna run this again locally, make sure it's working and then deploy this. And then we'll see um, if it's uh, actually working when deployed. So this should pull up a link. Okay, there we go. So that looks like that worked. So I'm gonna uh, check all this stuff in and then uh, deploy it and we'll see if it works. All right, so that looked like it finished. That build looks good. Let's go back to uh, overview, I'm gonna open this up again. Actually, it should already be open. And I'm just gonna refresh this page. Hopefully now it was successfully make a call to the back end. And you can see that my Netlify functions cheat sheet link is here. I can archive that thing. Hopefully, there we go. And then I could go in and delete it as well. So we've got all of the functionality, CRUD functionality uh, inside of React using our serverless functions inside of Netlify. We've got this hosted. Did I mention that you can take this URL and share with anybody out there that you want to? 
this is probably one of the easiest ways for you to build a really nice portfolio object that you can have hosted out of Netlify, have backend functionality with serverless functions, uh, and get to experiment with some new and cool technologies. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again for sticking around for a longer video, and I'll see you in the next one.